Hey. Hey, Kathy. Um, we are actually, I just turned it on. So we're live. I'm just going to like do a little be, bit, of, bit of debugging and do like the introductions and stuff. Um, Great. I'm also now just going to make sure that my setup is set up properly. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. So now. So you're going to give me share screen at some point, right? That's the idea? Yes. Let me actually do that right away before I forget. I'm, gonna, I'm about to make an announcement to the uh, gather, so um, okay. I won't be talking to you. <laughs> yeah, everybody's wandering off somewhere else. Um, let me figure out why I did that. Right, I'm
All right, I'm now unmuted myself on the Zoom, um, which means that if you are on the live, uh, if you're on the live stream, you should be hearing me. So um, I'm just noticing in the chat on the live stream, we have Charlie who says that he can't hear and Will Arnold who says that he can't hear. Um, it would be great if I could get a- So um, I'm just noticing in the chat on the live stream, we have Charlie who says that he can't hear and Will Arnold who says that he can't hear. Um, it would be great if I could get a- Okay, great. So um, uh, it now appears that uh, the Zoom uh, slash live stream is enabled. Um, okay, great. So um, uh, it now appears that uh, the Zoom uh, slash live stream is enabled. Um, okay, we now just need to. Um, deal with the uh, reverb between um, me coming out of Kathy's speaker and me coming back into Kathy's speaker. So just give us a moment as we deal with that and we'll uh, be ready to go shortly. Central Jay, do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Kathy. Okay. And I'm hearing you without getting feedback. Wonderful. And you see my slides on your Zoom share? Uh, I do. Okay. Is anyone here help see? Where are you folks think you're near the TV? Jens, are you near the TV? Can you say something, Kathy? Testing audio. Testing audio. Okay, then I get feedback on here, I think. Okay, 
Okay, people are saying we can hear you, so. And am I getting feedback when I do that? Um, Something. Okay, I did. I thought you were still working. So, okay, can you? Am I coming across? Feedback? Is this clear? Audio good? Audio good? Testing? Examples? Templates? Contracts? Testing? Contracts? Nobody's saying anything. All right, I think we're good, Kathy. Okay. All right. So, um, not loud enough. Somebody says. Yeah. I, it's okay. Is this better? This would be my normal volume when I'm speaking. Is that better? All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So now that we've uh, settled all of these, um, difficulties and uh, gotten everything ready. Um, I welcome you now to uh, RacketCon 2020. Um, I hope that you are all out there in the racket world um, uh, doing well and, and being safe and, and um, feeling secure in your circumstances. And I hope that we're able to make the most of this opportunity to be together virtually. Um, I am very excited about um, the chance to interact with more people than we might otherwise who wouldn't be able to fly out to Providence or Utah or St. Louis, wherever we would have had it this year. And um, uh, thank you so much for coming. Our first speaker will be um, Kathy Fissler. Our keynote speaker will be Kathy Fissler, um, who's a longtime member of the Racket Project. Um, she's been involved in uh, many different projects, especially uh, from the early days in the How to Design Programs curriculum. Um, and uh, um, I'm excited to have her here. <laughs> and uh, so take it away, uh, Kathy, welcome. Okay, thanks Jay and hello to everybody from whichever time zone you're, you're calling into, it's great to be here. As Jay said, I've been a longtime member of the Racket team. I consider myself a proud parent head. Um, parenthetically, I'm also a parent, but that's orthogonal to today. And I'm currently a computer science faculty member at Brown University, and I head up the Bootstrap Project. Uh, these will come up a little later in the, in the talk. So what's fun for me about giving this is this is a whole new experience of talk giving, not because I'm standing in my basement with no shoes on. What's really novel to me is I can't see the screen, which means, or I can't see all of your faces, which means I don't know where Matthias is. Now, for anybody who's new to the Racket environment, Matthias is the founding father, as it were, of the Racket universe. He and his grad students at the time in the early 90s, Robbie and Shuram and Matthew and Cormac and some others, were the ones who started the whole racket project. So I've given talks and classes in front of Matthias before, and Matthias has strong opinions and likes to, let's say, express them enthusiastically. So anytime I've given a talk with Matthias in the room before, I've always had my, my spidey sense, Cormac, that was for you, on about where is Matthias so I can duck when necessary. So what's interesting for me today is, I don't know where Matthias is, but also Jay presumably has a mute button. So this will be a whole new world for me of giving a, a racket-based talk. Okay, so let's get started with the, with the content. So we're all familiar with the idea of the language wars. Whether you're here from as a developer or a student, as an academic, you're familiar with the notion presumably of the language wars where people get together in polite company to debate our ideas about what the salient features are of our languages. So now when we are coming from the educational side, which is where I'm from, in computing education context, our version of the language wars tends to focus on things like the styles of problems we're assigning or the tools that we're using, maybe the syntax that we're using and the real world relevance 
of, of the examples we're presenting. And the racket team has been part of the language wars since really the early 90s, when in 1993, there was the birth of Dr. Racket. Um, I was there for the birth of Dr. Racket. It was an exciting thing to watch. And Dr. Racket brought in the idea of having language levels from an education standpoint, that we should gradiate the language and the error messages to meet the level where students are at. And then eight years later, it was followed by how to design programs, which gave the pedagogy that went with the environment, the main contribution of how to design programs being the design recipe. So for a long time, this community has been active in discussions about how to teach introductory programming. Now, I know many of you are coming from the developer side and won't necessarily know the pedagogic side of this. So I'm gonna give you a brief intro to the salient features of how to design programs that really play into the language wars in from the racket perspective. So at the heart of how to design programs is something called the design recipe. And with the design recipe, you start with something called the data definition, where you're basically writing out a description of the structure of the type of your data. So what I have on the screen here is a sample of the structure of a list of strings. Okay, this is done in comments, not written directly into the code, but it's meant to serve as a guide to have students articulate that they know what their design or their data is about before they start programming. From the data definition, we derive something called the template, which is a skeleton of code that matches the structure of the data definition. So here, for example, the data definition for a list has two cases. Either the list is empty or it's not empty. And the template correspondingly has a conditional, one case for the list is empty and one case for the list not being empty. Now the novel part about the template or the really novel and really useful part about it lies in the fact that it captures any recursive structure that exists in your data. So for example, if I'm defining a list of strings, you'll notice that on the list of strings, the second argument in the cons is itself a list. And in the template, that turns into a recursive call. So it's really capturing this idea of the structure of the code matches the structure of the data. So in the design recipe, you would start with these two steps before you're given a concrete problem. You just know you're working with lists. When you get your concrete problem, you write a series of examples or what some of us have called test cases in the past. We're revising the language now to talk about it more in terms of examples. And finally, you put all this together and write the code. And the idea is that once you've started from the template and thought through the examples, to get to the code, you're making fairly localized edits to match the computation you're trying to do. So in the code space at the bottom, what you see is I've highlighted in orange with underlining the characters that you had to add on top of the template to get to the complete solution, okay? So this in a nutshell is the pedagogic approach that was embraced in how to design programs. And it has a lot of salient features. So again, the heart of it's around the data definition and the template. You write out the shape of the data. The student has to show that they understand what data they're working with before they start working. You make the shape of the code follow the shape of the data. It's a design principle. It's the fundamental design principle, I'd say, for, for how to design programs. And then you avoid what we used to call the blank page syndrome, which is if a student stares at a sheet of paper and has no idea how to get started, the recipe is giving concrete steps, okay? And those steps are things the student can follow to at least get something on their paper before they get to the step of filling in the code rather than getting a problem and not knowing where to start, okay? Um, incidentally, I didn't say this at the beginning, but if you have clarification questions or anything, feel free to put them in the, uh, YouTube in the, which YouTube, YouTube. In the YouTube chat, uh, Shriram is sitting on the YouTube chat and will feed me any questions that come up that you want to clarify while I'm, while I'm going through, but I'm happy to take comments and questions as we go. Okay, now what was really nice about the design recipe 
in, in practice. So it applies very nicely when the recursion you need to do is structural. There are a lot of examples of structural recursions. So for example, there are aggregating functions like sum and length or concatenating all on a list of strings. There are filtering functions like searching, counting votes, looking for long words. There's transformational kinds of operations like capitalize all the words in a list or reformat everything in some other way. For those of you who speak higher order functions, which I assume most people in this audience would, we're talking about the folds, the filters, and the maps, right? Those functions that fall in that space or in compositions of functions in that space lend themselves beautifully to the, to the design recipe. It fits with cognitive science research. So what we know from cognitive science about how people learn to program is that people remember schemas of common code patterns. Okay, there's, as you're learning to program, your brain uh, begins to recognize certain patterns and it associates those patterns with triggers that you have from a problem. So what we expect to happen with the design recipe is that students will come to associate, oh, this is a list problem, I should use the list template. Okay, and this is what we're gonna see happens in practice. And again, it's consistent with what cognitive science research would predict that happens. So that's good. The design recipe scales nicely to other recursive data types besides lists. An example of that, for example, here's a binary tree definition up on the screen. And the real thing we notice with the binary tree definition compared to the list definition is you have two recursive subparts to your data, one for the left side of the tree and one for the right side of the tree. So in the data definition, I've highlighted that with orange. Down in the code template, we again reflect that structure by having two recursive calls to whatever function we're writing, one on the left side of the tree and one on the right. Okay. So the scalability is really nice. It scales up to definitions that involve multiple types. So here we have a list of trees. So there's a list definition and a tree definition, and these get more complicated into things like nested directories and file systems and whatnot. So the scaling of it is lovely. And that scaling led to the chapter structure of how to design programs. Okay, so we're gonna focus on the words in the middle of the slide for now. So you start off with atomic data, get students working with numbers and strings and whatnot, but then you build structures, then lists, then lists of structures, then trees, then mutual recursion. And that same design recipe carries through all of those forms of, of data, okay? And that's really where the beauty of it lies. We mentioned very briefly at the beginning that one of the pedagogic innovations of Dr. Rackett was this idea of language levels that grow with the student. And as you go through the curriculum, what you'll see with the stacked arrows just to the left of the words is like a rough sense of where those language levels come in. We're in a very beginning language where students don't know about lists. They don't know about functions of no arguments, but then they graduate into an intermediate language where they learn Lambda, they learn the higher order functions. And then they grow again into an advanced language that gives them access to concepts of state. So this is sort of the how to design programs, Dr. Racket programming world on a, on a quick slide. And it's been recognized, okay? Matthias has been awarded both the ACM Kallstrom Award and the SIG CSE Influential Educator Award for this, for this work. Um, so it's, and these are in the last several years. So it definitely had an impact and that was great. But it didn't take over the world, okay? When we first started, I remember sitting there with Matthias talking about how many years it would take for us to kind of take over the world with these great ideas. And let's just say we've missed the target, but why didn't it take over the world? Well, you know, there are the parentheses. Recursion is seen to be hard, which means harder than iteration. You can read volumes of papers that have been written arguing about recursion versus iteration. It's kind of a sub skirmish inside the language wars. There are people who look at it and say, that's 
unusual, and then stick to whatever they were doing. Rackets not used in industry um, or scheme at the time, and now racket, they're not real industrial languages, so students won't take to them. And you know, there are those parentheses, okay? So we didn't take over the world, but we had a small dedicated group of followers. It's gained traction. We've had footholds in places and it's worked well by and large in the places we've done it. So there we have our, our corner of the world. But now, you know, we're among friends, okay? So let's ask ourselves, how well has How to Design Programs really worked in practice? When we started this project long ago, none of us really had the expertise in education research to know how to answer these questions. People sometimes ask them of us, but we didn't really know how to formulate the answers in rigorous education methods. One of the things that's happened since I've moved on from my early days with the Racket Group is that I've spent the last 10 years becoming a computing education researcher. And Sriram has also come along, Sriram Krishnamurthy, and has also largely turned his work to computing education research. So we've really been in a position the last several years to dig into what we did and how to design programs, what everybody did, and understand how well it worked. So right now what I'm going to talk about is based off five years of educational research studies. A lot of this work was done jointly with Francis Castro Norwood, who's my PhD student who just graduated in May. So what are some of the questions we decided to ask? We looked at how do students perform on some of the benchmark computing education problems? The computing education world had been going for a while. They had some benchmarks. How do we do on them? Do students actually use the design recipe? And we've taught it to them. They've shown that they can regurgitate it on exams. But when they're actually left to themselves, are they using it? And is it actually helping them as they're using it? Okay, so these are kind of the three broad questions that uh, Francis and I looked at over the last few years. And I'll give you the punchlines, and then we'll just do a couple slides digging into what happened. So the punchline is, how do students perform on the benchmark examples? Really well, except when they don't. When there's a failure, it's a pretty spectacular failure. And we're gonna talk about that on the next slide. How much do students use the design recipe? We see several students actually using the template. Very few of them write examples. Again, this is outside of a exam or grading based context where they know they're being watched. Okay. And finally, how much does the design recipe help them? Not really help them once they get stuck. Okay, so let's dig into this a little bit and try to understand what's happening. To illustrate this, I'm going to use one of the benchmark examples from computing education research, which is called the rainfall problem. Now, some in the racket community have heard me talk about the rainfall problem before. I promise these are not the same slides you've seen on the rainfall problem, so don't tune out for more than about two minutes. Uh, but, but this is the rainfall problem. So it asks you to write a program that takes a list or an array of numbers and produces the average of the non-negative numbers in the list. There's also a twist that there may be like an end of data flag, minus 999 might appear in the input. And if it does, ignore everything from the minus 999 onward, okay? So again, this is a problem that has been given in computing science, computing education studies since the 1980s, and historically students do very badly on it. Sufficiently badly that in 2010, Mark Guzdial, who is a professor currently at University of Michigan, he used to be at Georgia Tech, but he's one of the leading bloggers probably in the world on computing education. Mark posed a problem of why hasn't computer science education beaten the rainfall problem. Why do still students, why do students still get stuck on this? And in that post, he said, I suspect HDP could have students beat this problem. And Mark issued a challenge to me over lunch one day and said, hey, have your students do this. Let's see what happened. So we did. We got students from uh, five classes across four universities to work on the rainfall problem. And we analyzed the solution. Uh, we had about 400 submissions. We closely categorized and analyzed about 200 of them. And we see that over 85% of them solve it correctly. 
This is vastly higher than what you see out of any of the other studies in the space. And the results been sufficiently exciting to people who follow rainfall that Mark now runs around and tells people, Kathy beat the rainfall problem, okay? And you know, it's, it's great to get some, some recognition for that, but let's understand why. And let's understand what happened. So the students who beat the rainfall problem, they tended to do it by making use either of a built-in function like length or a higher order function like a filter. Okay, there's a high correlation between having used one of those built-in functions or higher functions and getting to success on the problem. Not uniform, but it's there. But here's the more interesting part. The students who started out raw by looking at the problem and writing the template as the design recipe taught them to do, never finish. They don't get the problem right. And that is interesting. Why do these students get stuck and why do they not finish? Let's think about this problem, okay? Let's write an example for it. I'm gonna compute the average. Let's just work with average for a moment. Okay, let's not even work with, with the negative numbers and the, and the minus 999. If I ask you to write a test case for average, you might write down, well, if I average the list of two, one, and three, I get two. Great. Now what I want you to do is use the two to compute the average of list four, two, one, three. So we kept the two, one, three, we cons to four onto the front. And now you can work with the two, which is the result of the average on the rest of the list, and the four, which is the first of the list. And it's your job to combine two and four to give me the average of this list. It doesn't work, right? And this might be some very advanced things you could do, but generally this is not a, average is not a problem that lands in structural recursion. And this is inherently the problem, that if students just blindly copy down the list template or said follow it procedurally like they've been told to do, they end up writing a skeleton of code that calls the rainfall function on the rest of the list. And they can't figure out what to do with it. We've done a lot of talk aloud observational studies. Most of my research on this after that first rainfall study has been with, well, really Francis, watching students do a lot of solve problems, watch how they're doing it and making field notes and annotations on the transcripts. And what we see is students are working on rainfall. Many of them look at the problem and say, oh, average. Okay, this looks like average. And I know that average is sum divided by count. And rainfall is just a modification of that where we do the sum and the count without the negatives. If a student thinks through the problem this way, what they have now are three structurally recursive problems, dropping out the negatives, summing them, counting them. If they think through that decomposition, they do fine. Whether they write it with higher order functions or whether they write it as straight out manually recursive functions, they do fine. But the ones who don't decompose and go straight to following the template, they get stuck and they don't finish, okay? And that's really what's going on with the students who don't do well on the rainfall problem out of HDP. All right, so what are the research takeaways from all of this? The templates are the most often used part of the design recipe. As I said, Francis has watched a lot of students working. The idea that they know how to follow the template even if they don't write it all down right from the beginning, the template gets encoded for students, at least working on list problems. And as I pointed out earlier, that's consistent with what ed research would, would suggest. When how to design program train students work with or decompose problems that fit structural recursion, it works pretty much the way we'd want it to. It's playing out very nicely. But once students writing code, start writing their code, they stick to their approach. And if their approach was not going to get them to a solution, like instantiating the template without doing decomposition, they're never going to recover. This is also consistent with cognitive science research. Students do not undo work that they do. 
Okay, it's only as we gain expertise in programming that we understand the idea of prototyping and throwing away code. So we see how this all comes about. So the takeaway, or really the conclusion that we drew out of all this work was to say that the idea of decomposition and task planning needs to be taught in the early parts of HTTP in a way that's much more explicit than how it's ever been articulated in the, in the book. As Matthias says, there are elements of it there. He and I have had this, this conversation, but it's not as explicit that all instructors who pick up the book would necessarily recognize to do it. And you know, one more takeaway here is, and this was more that I got from other educational research, not my research on HDP, is that if you teach only template-based problems, students are not going to learn how to use, how to scope when to use the template. You have to see variety in the problems that you're given so that you learn when something applies and when it doesn't. So the beauty of HDP is this structure that goes all the way through with the same design recipe. It applies, it applies, it applies. But unless we show students how it doesn't apply, they're not gonna really appreciate how to use the recipe and or really the template part of the recipe when it does apply, okay? All right, so what do we as the racket community take away from this? You know, we got our map, we've got our, our merry band of, of racketeers here. And this says, great, let's fortify what we do. Okay, let's deal with this task planning problem. Let's make some adjustments and, and we'll come on and hopefully get more people comfortable using HDP. And this is missing something. The action of intro computing has moved. And we would have a lot to say in this new space if only we were over in that part of the, of the debate. Okay, and where has the action moved? The action's moved to data science. Now, data science, it's a term that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Here, we're broadly gonna use the term data science to be thinking about where we have gathered data and we're analyzing data in order to understand phenomena about artifacts, about, about people. Again, there's like kind of an elephant here. We could be looking at different sides of it. I'll clarify what I'm talking about as we go along. Okay. But people are talking about data, data science, and all these things a lot, both in the context of computational practice and in the process of computing education. So it's not just a buzzword. Data analytics is changing the practice of many disciplines of CS and many disciplines outside of CS. So if you're going to graduate with a computer science degree in this age, you really should be able to work with data. I don't mean that you have to be able to work with big data, whatever big data means, but you need an understanding about data and how to think about data and how to use it effectively. Now, I think the bigger point from an education perspective is this isn't just about CS majors. This is huge for non-CS majors because of the way that data is permeating all of these other disciplines. If you're working in any of the social sciences, you're dealing with, with data in a lot of your work. If you are in the humanities and digital humanities, there's a lot of data showing up there. Science, arts, it's all over the place. This is really cool, but here be dragons, okay? If we're not strategic, and by we, I mean those of us involved in intro computing education, not just the racket folks, if we are not strategic, the dragon's gonna get us. And what's the dragon? Let's look at what we see happening in a lot of universities right now. They're making data science majors, data science programs, maybe they're minors, but there are data science curricular things popping up at a lot of schools now. Why? Well, you know, it's the hot thing. They wanna get students taking them, but I wanna look at the content of these programs. A lot of these programs are gonna start usually with two courses and they're in different orders in different, different schools. But roughly you have to do stats early on and you do some kind of scripting like, uh, scripting with data like course, okay? Where you're learning to do basic analyses with data. And then later on in the upper levels, you'll do more stats, you'll do a big data course, you'll do some data management. 
Now let's contrast that to what we have going on in computer science. So in computer science, we typically start with some intro course that either focuses on or heavily makes use of programming. Then students go into something on data structures and then up level in the curriculum, if they're interested in the data content, they get to some databases, some data science and machine learning and a bunch of other classes, including some that have nothing to do with data, but that's not relevant for, for this talk here. Okay. Now, what's happening with students going through these, these courses? Well, let's say you have someone who goes in to study data science and they get to the scripting class which again, maybe their first or their second class, and they say, wow, programming is great. I wanna switch over to computer science. Or we see students who start as computer science majors, they get up to the data science class and say, oh, this is cool. I really wanna go focus on data. Or you get students in the data science who say, oh, wow, well, this data management, that's what I wanna do. I'm really gonna need databases, which is pretty high up in the, in the CS major. The point is there's so little content alignment early on between data science and computer science that switching effectively requires you to start over. So you might've put a year into one program, finally realized which one you like better, and now you gotta start all over again in the other program. And that's really a missed opportunity because look, novices, students coming into college, they don't understand the difference between computer science and data science well enough to know what they wanna do. That's not surprising. But having them split like this is starting to cause problems for those of us who teach you know, and are having students try to say, oh, I started here, but now I wanna move over. And this is something I, I was seeing at, at Brown. What we really need to realize when we talk about this space is there's really three separate areas here, three separate kinds of foci, foci that students could have to what they're trying to do. There's computer science, there's data science, and there's data engineering, which often gets drowned out in the context of data science. But people who really understand data science separate data science, which is more of the statistics and the analytics from data engineering, which is a lot of the management that goes in around data. So let's think about these three fields. So I said data engineering, it's frequently overlooked. Data science is appealing to students across campus because they see how they're gonna have to use that in the jobs they're trying to do. And in computer science, most of our CS1 courses are currently sitting in the part of this Venn diagram that is divorced from data science or data engineering. Now, Data engineering needs non-trivial computer science, okay? You have to do things like databases and networks and, and things like that to be able to do data engineering. So a student who wants to end up in data engineering from data science is gonna have to route in through computer science at some point. We've already argued that with data becoming so foundational across com com computing disciplines, excuse me, that computer science majors should have data and some statistics so they can speak in this world. And computer science is going through a separate orthogonal question, but that it will end up not being as orthogonal as you might think to this conversation, which is that there's increasing calls for computer science to think about the social responsibility of computing. Into all this, what I wanna argue in the rest of this talk is that putting our intro course at the intersection of these three areas, creating a course that could be taken by students either in the data science or the computer science path, acknowledging for the moment that most of the data engineers are gonna discover themselves coming in thinking they did one of the other two, that this would be a sweet spot that would give students a chance to start to understand all three of these areas and then plan their courses from there, okay? All right, so let's say that this is what we wanna do. We wanna design a course that's gonna land in the intersection of these three areas. Now, how does how to design programs stack up as a foundation for such a class like this? So this is the same topics list I showed you earlier. And if we look at where do we really get to the kinds of data and the kinds of programs that one would expect students to write when analyzing a collection of, of say observational data, it finally comes up when we get to list of structs, okay? So 
there's a fairly good sized chunk of material. The design recipe in multiple stages, learning syntax, learning notation, before the problems feel real to students who are there from a data perspective, okay? Which really begs a question, is there any way to start this content earlier so that the relevance of it becomes apparent to the students who are interested in this from a data perspective, and frankly, to influence our own teaching to make it more relevant to those students. This is not just a fault of the students. Now, a list of structs is effectively a table, okay? So let's shift the conversation a little bit. Let's think about data tables and how they might serve as a foundation for an intro computing class. So it's rich, structured data, but the format is familiar. Many students will have worked with it in a spreadsheet. Even if it hasn't, they can look at this kind of data and make sense of it, which means that there are many authentic tasks and questions that you can give students to ask about tabular data. For example, you could ask a question like, how many tickets were sold with a student discount? Now that's gonna let students explore problem decomposition, right? If you look at this table as it is, this table's in no shape to answer questions about the student discount. The capitalization's not consistent in column D. There are some missing values. You also have to isolate which rows have to do with students. There's a lot of moving parts, but that's what problem decomposition is about teaching. It's about finding those moving parts. This is the task planning that we talked about finding was missing in the way students trained with straight up HTTP were displaying when we did our, our research studies, okay? And finally, there is also a, a recipe, not the HTTP design recipe, but there is a recipe, a checklist that you go through to prepare a data for analysis. You normalize your data. You locate the suspicious data to decide how to handle it. You sanity check with visualizations. And only after all that do you analyze. So starting with tables, you can introduce a lot of the things that we care about in computing, but in a setting that the students have a feel for on entry. This is also as much data engineering as data science. Right? The data science would come in when you apply some of the statistical techniques to make sense of this. But most of what I'm talking about here is more in the management and the structuring of data. So this is the big picture punchline in some sense, is that if we start thinking about tabular data, we get to a lot of our goals quickly. Now, fine, but let's go back to our, our little stakeout in the language wars. We're the racketeers, we're functional programming. What do we have to do with any of this? Well, functional programming underlies tools for processing tabular data. So advanced R um, is by Hadley Wickham is one of the well-known books for understanding how to program in R. R is one of the main languages for doing data science and data analytics. And I've just taken here the text from the introduction of, of Hadley Wickham's book. R at its heart is a functional language. And he goes on to talk about how functional techniques are getting a surge of interest because that's how data science is practiced. So if you're feeling down about the real world relevance of functional programming in the world today, go read the introduction of Advanced R by Hadley Wickham. It's freely available online. And you know it says things that many of us have believed, but it's really bringing it together in a industrial relevant context that also matters to students. So our goal here is we're gonna to try to design an intro CS course that integrates computer science, data science, and data engineering. It teaches program design and analysis design practices. It'll appeal to students across the university. We can't just talk to the computational and the STEM majors now. We also want it to generate confidence in newer programmers that they can apply computational techniques in the work they wanna do that isn't inherently in computing. And we wanna help students decide their next steps. And their next steps could be, this is the last class I ever wanna take on this, but it could also send them in the direction of data science CS or data engineering. 
Now, what I'm talking about here is embodied in a course called CS111, which we've been developing at Brown for the last three years, uh, Computing Foundations Data. And the ideas that have gone into 111 and the design have been heavily influenced with discussions over the years with Sri Ram Krishnamurthy, Ben Lerner, Joe Politz, and Doug Woos. And we're going to make a little shift here. Okay, we're going to shift away from Racket as I go through this and talk in terms of Pirate which is the language that we're gonna build this course on. And I'm gonna explain why in the remaining few slides of the talk. So high level, what's the topic organization of this new course? And the whole movement in general, we're calling data centric introduction to computing, okay? So the HTTP schedule is on the right of your screen. One thing you'll see is that we're trying to move tables, which was the old list of structs content up into really being the first data structure that students work with. And they're only going to get to structs after they get to lists. Okay. And again, I'm going to show you why as we go through the design. Task planning is going to come up early in the context of tables. The other thing that's going to start coming up early is socially responsible computing. So we're dealing with a number of the issues that have underlied um, conventional CS curricula in the data age. I wanna go through highlights of the table of contents to show you how we're setting students up with these ideas. So we start with images. And one of the first things that we will talk about is how to build up images of flags. Okay, flags are a lot of fun. Students can pick the flags they wanna build and there's a lot of composition and decomposition in them. But the real point we drive through this part of the course is that the structure of the code follows the structure of the image. That should sound familiar except our data here is an image and the structure is what they perceive visually, not what they have in a data structure encoded in, uh, in programming language data structures. But we set that tone early. We move on to tables. And this is the point where Pirate really comes in. Pirate has been built with native support for, for tables. So the same sample table is up at the top of the screen. Below it is an example of what the table looks like if we type it in manually in Pirate. You can also import tables from Google Drive, which is how we do any of our larger examples, but students write examples and small testing tables, for example, manually, as I've shown you here. And the build column line at the bottom of that code block is an example of how you do an operation on a table. Here, we're trying to add a new column to the right edge of the table, that is the total fee at a cost of $10 per ticket, okay? But the point is what you're doing, things like build column, this is a higher order function that works on tables, okay? Now, from tables, we're gonna go to lists. And for lists, what we're gonna do is start extracting columns. Maybe I want to know how many people were interested in ordering uh, getting tickets by email versus by picking them up, okay? So we'll extract that column out as a list and work with it as a list. But remember where they're coming from. They've done higher order functions on tables. So now they're well positioned to use higher order functions on lists, okay? So this is a big point of departure from how to design programs. We are gonna do higher order functions first and then introduce recursion and a list template, okay? So templates for us come up only this point into the semester after students already have some confidence in programming. Okay, data types. What are we gonna do with data types? Well, we're gonna start a conversation about how to represent timestamps. So we're gonna add a column with a timestamp. Should that be a string? Should that be a number? It's actually a fun day in class when we kind of beat our heads around this, this exercise, ultimately realizing that we need a notion of a struct. And we'll put a struct inside a column to represent a timestamp. This gives you so many opportunities to discuss data design trade-offs and connect it to real world issues. When we're talking about structs, now we're talking about how do you embed structured data in a CSV file? How do you extract it from a CSV file? Again, the similar kinds of technical techniques we've wanted to teach students, but all motivated in this data context. Okay, so here's another table I want us to think about. 
Here is a table with rows for a bunch of people. And what the highlighting is trying to point out is in this table, we're trying to give you the genealogy of a family where Anna has Susan as her mother and Charlie as her father. And Susan is another row on her table, okay? Now for us, we recognize that what's going on here are trees, okay? But what we tell the students is tables aren't always a useful data structure. Your data doesn't fit in a table, or if your data doesn't make sense in a table, because computing something like ancestors over this is a headache. We give students that problem. We got watch them really get kind of nervous about what we're asking them to do. And then we point out that the problem is your data is wrong. So we switch at this point over to trees. And now we start a segment of introducing data structures beyond tables. And here comes computer science. We wrap up the course talking about state and hash tables using Python. Now, if we were in the room, I expect I'd be hearing some notion of twittering, sighing, grunting, um, what other kind of comments. But this move to Python is actually an extremely positive feature of the course. Why? Because for students who want to take one course and stop, Python leaves them in an ecosystem that they can continue to learn on their own by web-based resources, they can go into projects in professors' research labs all around campus that are being done in Python and contribute. This is the API that our colleague departments are using and that students need to appreciate. So what we're doing in this class is making the transition from Pirate to Python. Pirate, Python. Pirate was designed to smooth out this transition, okay? And it works beautifully. We do a day of day or two of lecture of practice writing our pirate programs in Python, and then we go on with more material in Python. It's worked very nicely over the time we've doing it. What's the data out of the course? We've had 250 students go through it over the last three years. This semester, we have 370. They come from all over campus. The diversity ratios are better than we've ever seen them before. The non-CS majors absolutely love it. Okay, they say things like it's the first time a computer science class that they looked at hasn't been scary. It's felt exciting. We get stories that they are going back and using it in their other disciplines. And many of them have either become CS majors or added a CS major or at least a, a minor as a result of going through this, this class. Shurim and I wrote an article, it was in CACM in July, that outlays this whole idea of data-centric computing education. So if you wanna see the argument developed out in text format, there's the, there's the paper. And I've got the textbook in progress. We'll have the textbook on all this out, which builds again off work that Joe and Ben and Shurim have done for many years. We're gonna come out with the data-centric textbook, probably um, the end of the calendar year. Okay, so now what are the takeaways? Let's wrap this up. Many jobs and domains depend on data and data analytics. It's happening. It's not necessarily big data that gets a lot of press, but that's not what we necessarily have to talk about to be responsible for our students. But our students across campus need to work with data in disciplined ways. And if there's one thing the racket education community knows how to think about, it's how to program and work with data in disciplined ways. But we have to modernize and bring ourselves to where this discussion is currently happening. More broadly, computer science can get with the program and start thinking about how to do data education or watch other departments do it for us. You already see intro to programming in, blah, 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 coming up in lots of other departments and leaving students ill-prepared to then participate in additional computing background if they need it. Functional programming has a significant role to play in this space, as do educators who think about functional programming. But we have to go in and claim it. Because right now, most of the space is a war between R and Python, excuse me, an enlightened debate between R and Python. Now, Python, 
it's amazing that for all the talk that Python is the easy language to learn, there is no good pedagogic IDE for teaching Python. I've spent two years, three years trying to find one. There's nothing satisfying out there. Python has some really bizarre corner cases and white space has semantics. Really? That's fun with novice programmers. R has its own set of bizarre complexities, but you know, more generally, R was designed for data science. It's not designed for general CS. So it's not really the best foundation for a course that's trying to give a base for multiple disciplines. So we have settled on pirate in what we're doing in this in this episode. I'm uh, sorry, in this in this work. But you know, we're at Racketcon. I'm sympathetic. Kind of what's going on with Racket? Why is why is pirate what we're using? Really, there's a couple of main things going on. So Pirate has table support, which our curriculum depends on. That could easily be built into Racket. So that's not a, a big feature. Examples are part of function definitions. They're separate from tests. I didn't really have time to go into that here, but it's a really nice mechanism for anybody who hasn't seen Pirate before in terms of supporting uh, design and early learners in education. But Python, Pirate has a Python S syntax. I know, we know in this room, the parentheses are fine, but you know, outside of this space, the parentheses really are problematic for some people. Now, this whole talk is not coming down to an argument about syntax. Also in the last several years, the research group at Brown has been building additional tools into the Pirate ecosystem. So one really nice one is the exemplar system which has been developed by Sriram and his PhD student, Jack Wren. The idea of exemplar is to take that part of the design recipe that says write examples and make it something actionable out of which students get feedback, okay? In the studies we did, Francis and I see very few students writing examples. Exemplar is giving them a value to writing their examples. What Exemplar does under the hood is it gives the students feedback as to whether the tests they have correctly re reflect the problem the professor asked and whether they're hitting interesting corner cases. Um, the, basically underneath the system, you provide some buggy implementations as well as some good ones and give the students feedback as to whether they'll be able, able to identify which are the uh, buggy ones and which are the correct ones. And you know, it really comes down to this idea of can we get students to write tests early without coercing them to do it? So at the Brown team, we're trying to, to build this into our actual tools. We also have another tool that doesn't yet have a pretty screenshot uh, called the Data Design Druid, which is looking at the data definitions part of the recipe and how you build tool support to help students think through the consequences of learning to, to design data and how to make those trade-offs. All of this is being driven by CS education research. Okay, both our own and research of others. This whole effort in building data-centric introduction to computing is to really draw on the best of what we learned, both ourselves and others. But I do want to pull this back just to, to finally close this out with one last slide. We are at RacketCon, okay? And let's not um, lose sight of the fact that RacketCon, or sorry, the Racket community set out a beautiful principle for thinking about teaching computing. It's that computing education rests on a three-legged stool. You need a programming language, a programming environment, and a pedagogy that all work together and are co-designed to let students seamlessly work among all those areas. That, I think, is the big enduring contribution that's come out of the work in, in uh, the Racket community. How Design Programs has been a nice uh, snapshot of what we thought about how to do that one point in time, but this stool perseveres, this will endure. And it's based on a lot of programming languages research. That's been the strength of this group, especially as we start thinking a little bit about education. We've had courses at Rice and WPI and Northeastern and a whole bunch of other places um, that have built courses on this stool with Racket. We have built Bootstrap, which is a national, US national and some places international curricular effort for middle and high school students, integrating computing into algebra and data science contexts through what we've done in this group. And now we have the newly emerging 
data-centric introduction to computing. And where we're expanding our strength now is we're also building in knowledge of the research in computing education, which just stands to make what we can do in this group so much stronger. So I'll end with a call to arms. Let's revolutionize interest CS once again. Let's figure out how to bring data into the fold and continue to make great contributions. Thanks everybody. And I look forward to getting some questions. So uh, because of the unique way of doing this, so um, everyone uh, who's watching, please clap yourself wherever you are, you know, look around the room and look at your, you know, your family and clap and say, I'm clapping for Kathy Fussler. Um, let's now do some questions. So Jay, what we're going to suggest is if people want to type their questions into the YouTube chat, Shroom's sitting next to me, he can read them out and then I would still have my slides if I need them. Does that work? Yeah, well, so the way that we've planned it is, is that I actually have a list of questions that people have been typing into a document the whole time. Oh, okay. Um, and then uh, that's the way we'll be doing it for all of the RacketCon uh, talks. Okay, sounds so, good. Um, so yeah, so if you do have questions, uh, people have been monitoring both chats and copying them into this document. And okay. because of the delay, um, you know, when you ask a question in either of those chats, um, you know, you won't be able, to, I, I won't immediately ask it, of course, uh, but you can put it in the document and then we'll get to it. We'll do about 15 minutes of questions um, and then we'll switch to back to the gather and then uh, Kathy will be available in discussion area A. Mm -hmm. um, also, I want to mention that um, our next um, speaker will be at, um, at 12.30, uh, well, 12.30 uh, Eastern time, so basically in about an hour and a half from now. Okay, with that, Kathy's questions. Um, so the first question, um, um, back when you were talking about the rainfall problem, you were talking about how students get stuck um, when they follow the, um, when, the, when they follow the normal rules that how design program says. Now someone asked, um, are they following the rules like rigorously? Do they write good signatures, purpose statements? Do they come up with good examples or do they get totally off track? So what we find is they, they I mean, they write down a function header. Uh, they write the contracts. They kind of, they can do that pretty well at that point. Um, if they write examples, they do so in an extremely cursory way. And when we've done talk aloud studies with students, we sometimes ask them a little bit about it. Say, hey, you know, you didn't write many examples. Oh, yeah, you know, I take the ones out of the problem. The students are not finding the examples helpful by and large mm -hmm. because they haven't really learned what to do with them in some sense. So there are students who write down examples, but you kind of tell that they're writing them down because they've been, they've been told they should. But we very rarely see students go back to an example in a talk aloud study and talk through that and engage with their examples again later. So what we really do see is that students start and they write down the template. That's where the design recipe starts for a lot of students in practice. I see. Okay, um, so the next question is kind of related. Um, so someone is wondering whether you think that uh, test-driven design is kind of the same thing as how to design programs and what DCIC is doing, or whether you would distinguish uh, that term from what you're doing in your classes and the idea of, of uh, how to design programs. Yeah, no, I mean, we're not doing test-driven design. Um, we have the terminology we've really been shifting to, at least in what Shroom and I have been doing over at Brown, is talking about writing examples first. And the idea with examples first is you're writing down a collection of illustrative examples to make sure you understood the question. And that is a different goal than what you're trying to do in test-driven design, where you're really trying to get to a test suite that will capture everything. So I think there is a big difference there. Um, we're not having them write some tests and then develop some code and then write more tests and develop more code. We're really trying to take them through a, pro a process of making sense of the problem first. And this is something that has a lot of traction in math education research, for example. So that's, it's really not the same thing. Great. Um, okay. So um, this is uh, kind of an aside back. So we're, we're talking about the rainfall thing, but here's a question kind of jump way to the end. Um, okay. 
On, in terms of Python pedagogical IDEs, I mean, what's your feeling on um, the notebook style, like Jupyter Notebook? <laughs> so, yeah, so notebooks have some real challenges. For example, well, let me contrast notebooks to say using a REPL, okay? In notebooks, each cell is its own computational window, okay? So if you make an edit in a local window, and you run it, you may be getting state from other computations without those having gotten kept properly aligned, right? So when you keep all of your code in one IDE file and you run the whole file start to finish, then you're guaranteed that you're not getting accidental results because your state updated in some parts and not others. That's more challenging in the notebook context. Also, Notebooks, from what I have seen and tried to use them, they don't really do anything by way of good error messages. They're not really giving students any pedagogic scaffolds. So they might be fine as a device for organizing your code, but for really teaching students to think about code and how code runs and why it's structured, I just don't think they're giving us anything. Um, um, so there's a follow-up question to this, which is, is that, um, the Julia notebooks uh, have tried to address this incremental state problem. Can you speak to that at all? I've never looked at them, so I don't know what they're doing, but I will say, you know, again, as someone dealing with pedagogy, teaching non-majors, I need something that I can really rely on to have pedagogic support. So uh, yeah, I, so I would have to look to see what they've done, but I am generally wary that notebooks are easier for professionals or people who are already sufficiently confident in their ability to work well in data science for a raw novice who's afraid of working with the computer and not sure how it all works. I'm not convinced that the overhead is, isn't a problem there. Great. Um, so now let's bridge those two questions together, um, which is, is that um, you kind of motivated the changes in DCIC relative to HTTP based on the rainfall problem. And this idea that people like aren't willing to change their approach. They don't decompose their problems. Mm -hmm. And you talked about how tables um, were a way of bringing some of that decomposition. Now, a question is, are you now teaching decomposition explicitly or is it still implicit where some people get it the way that they used to in have design programs? No, we're, actually, we're yeah. teaching it explicitly now. Um, and for an example here, so if I, gave students, so let me just, um, you know, let me just go back to this, to the, just get the table up, for example. If we wanted the students to tell us uh, what the average number of tickets purchased in an email order is, what we have them do is they actually have to produce a text-based list of what are the subtasks that go into getting there. So they have to talk about things like, normalizing the values in the column, if they haven't already, isolating the rows that involve email, isolating the tickets, summing it up. We actually have them submit these task plans separately from their code. So for those of you who are familiar with the design recipe, the task plans have become a separate deliverable in the process. And we use that to then guide students to say, okay, now let's figure out how you're going to implement this task in the in the task plan and we build the code up around that. Great, and a follow up to that, are you also explicitly teaching the idea that sometimes you need to go back and do something else? Is there a way to teach people to like make a mistake, so to speak, and then learn the process of prototyping that you mentioned uh, before is something that mainly, you know, uh, expert programmers are familiar with? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, what I've been trying to do there is just be talk about it really openly with students instead of just letting them figure that out by experience. Um, in a lecture, I will remind them that this is normal practice. I don't yet have materials like in the, the curricular materials that actually practice that. Um, it would be a good idea to, to find a way to do something on that. But yet we find, and, and other computing education researchers are finding this too, that students come in with a bunch of myths about what real programmers do they end up being very self-defeating. So like they assume that programmers sit down and write full complete programs from the first character to the last character. They assume that real programmers never look at documentation, right? There's a bunch of these things. 
um, that research is now documenting students believe. And so things like those, and sometimes you have to throw away all your code, we're just bringing those up and talking about them explicitly with students now. Okay, there are two questions about your, um, about uh, CS education that people would like you to explain to them. Um, do people agree that the three-legged stool is a good model? And is there any evidence for your claims about notebooks that they are, that they have these problems? Or is that just, uh, you know, Kathy's wisdom? Yeah, okay, so in terms of the three-legged stool, I don't know of any research that has studied the three-legged stool. What I'm aware of is looking at what we have been able to do both across how to design programs and now in DCIC that really takes advantage of the stool. Um, you know, we do have examples where when uh, the, back in the day when we were first starting the, the racket work, uh, people would talk about programming in subsets of C++, right? Because C++ was the language du jour at the time for intro computing. And you would say, well, we'll just have them work in a restricted subset. But you'd still get the error messages leaking out. So, I mean, you'd see papers that indirectly talked about students getting frustrated with errors. Um, no, And the, the folks trying to mitigate that by saying, oh, we'll just stay in this space and pretend they never get to those. So it was never research that directly connected all of it. But I think there has been research showing where students fall into different cracks. And the three-legged stool is one way that helps prop up some of those cracks. As for the comments on notebooks, there have been a handful of papers written about notebooks and talking about notebooks in educational contexts, some of them critical because of these issues. So none of this is anything that I've personally uh, I can, written. You want me to oh. post, I can post the Austin Henley paper and the Joel Gross talk. Okay, so Shroom is gonna post into where? Uh, YouTube chat. Shroom's gonna post into the YouTube chat two specific references that, that speak to that. Great, okay. So um, two questions about um, DCICS, or sorry, DCIC. Mm -hmm. um, so um, would you say that this is a class that is good for totally non-CS students who are only doing something interdisciplinary? And how do you control the prerequisites uh, in a way to make it so that they can uh, get something out of it and also CS students get something out of it? Okay, so yes, this is a prerequisite free intro course. Okay, there are no prerequisites other than having been admitted to Brown for this. I'm just trying to get over to the slide that has the, um, here we go, that has the, the curricular sequence on it. Um, basically, when we look at distinguishing the students who are really going to go on from in CS and the students who are just going to kind of stop and not go very far, really it all lands in one place, trees. Okay, our experience is that the students who are really not into computing and programming, they love the images. They, they get the images. A lot of them say, oh, I can do that. They really talk about being more relaxed after spending a week and a half at the beginning of the semester working on composing images. We get to tables, which again, they understand intuitively what they're, what they're doing. Lists don't surprise anybody. Data types go okay. Trees really bowl some people over. We deal with this in the class. Frankly, trees are not a significant part of the grade. I mean, they're, they take, we spend about a week on it in the middle. For the students who are going on in computer science, we make it very clear to them what they need to be able to do with this material to move on. For the students who aren't, we say, look, you know, if this doesn't grab it for you, it's okay. Um, they don't really get sophisticated test questions on trees other than recognizing that a table is really tree shaped, right? That's kind of the learning outcome that we want everybody to have out of the class. Actually writing recursive programs on trees, we don't really expect everybody's gonna be comfortable with that even though we do, we do cover it. So the class has been wildly successful with students who are not, have no prior computing experience and are afraid of the computer science department at Brown. Great. Um, was that the whole question or did I miss a part? No, that's good. Um, can you compare the class to the class R for data science? And there's a link that has a, a New Zealand um, uh, domain name. Are, are you familiar with this class? 
probably Hadley Wickham's. Is project. well, is that based on Hadley Wickham's since that's he's in New Zealand? Presumably. So um I mean, I don't know the class in any detail. I have skimmed the table of contents of, of Hadley's book. You know, as I said, I think the difference is that an R-based class, I mean, R as a language was designed more for doing data analysis. Uh, we really are dealing a lot more with a broader spectrum of computing and computer science. So we're not only in the data analysis context. And I think that context is pretty important to set for, for students. Um, so I'd have to look at the specifics of what's, what's in there, but I am generally concerned about R as being a language that claims to be both intro CS and intro data science in ways that really starts to talk about the non-data set There's parts no of computer science. science. In the book. I'm looking at the book right now. Cool. Okay, so um, another question, um, and this is about uh, the decomposition issue. Um, mm -hmm. So how do people know that the subtasks are simpler or smaller when they're complete beginners, it's their first thing, and they everything is complicated to them? Can you talk about that? Sure. So, how, so first of all, what we're trying to do is get them to identify pieces. And what tends to happen and what we're trying to get them to realize is that as they break the problem down, they're breaking it down to things that they recognize. Okay, so a student might not recognize, for example, how to do this computation of the average number of tickets for birthdays. But if I say to them, do you know how to find the rows of the table that use the student discount? Yeah, we did that in class last week. Okay, that's one of your tasks, right? So a lot of it is about, it's, it's a very scaffolded process of having them take the problem they've been given and identify elements of it that they already know how to do. And then filling in the holes. Okay, well, how are you gonna get from this piece you know to this piece? Oh, I'm gonna to have to pull out that, that column and, and average it or sum it or whatever. This again is really consistent with computing education research. So for those of you who are teaching, um, I put together a video for my class on this basically about how this process of decomposition lets our brains help us build up solutions to code when we are new to, new to computing. Um, so do they necessarily know they got it right? No, that's why they, they submit it for homework. We give them feedback. We talk about it in class. But the idea is to take the big problem and break it down to something you already recognize and then to build your code up from there. Great. Um, so here's a question. Um, in traditional classes, uh, and even in how design programs, you give a problem and then there's like a very complete specification and then you have to go figure it out uh, and build your examples and then solve it. In contrast, in many data centric classes, um, the emphasis is on exploring the data, trying to discover what's in the data. Do yep. you address that and how can you reconcile these two uh, distinct uh, perspectives? So we do a lot of that in, in DCIC. Um, if you look closely at this table, um, there are errors abound in this, in this table. Um, you know, we have missing data. Some of the cells in column D actually have strings of white space and they're not blank. Um, there's a, one of the email over here is actually email um, over in column E. So we do a lot with giving students broken data and say and talk about what how do you use computation to help you understand your data and get to the point that you're going to be confident working with it. So we teach them how to visualize. You know, there, there's a plotting library in Pirate. So we'll say, let's do a couple of plots. Do you notice anything weird? When we do this table example here, the reason we even find the email typo, typo is because we asked to see a distribution of delivery methods and there's this second email column in the, um, in the distribution frequency bar chart that we produce. So no, we're spending a lot of time talking about that and we're using those as examples of programs that they can write. And again, it's ideas that they kind of, they're comfortable with them. Um, they might not know all these ideas, but they can certainly imagine that data is 
broken in, in different ways. So I think working with data gives us great opportunities to do this. Um, there's also a whole practice out of math education called notice and wonder. And in notice and wonder, you give somebody a scenario, but you don't ask them a question. So we might give you this table, I'm not going to tell you what to compute out of it, but we'll say, what do you notice about this table? What questions do you have? And that invites them to kind of scrutinize and say, wait a minute, well, we've got like the word three and that doesn't look right. So we're building that practice in as well. How do we reconcile that with really precise problem statements? There are different kinds of exercises in the course. Some exercises, if the goal is to write a correct, a functioning, correctly functioning program, will give you a very precise problem statement. But sometimes I'm gonna give you a table and say, what are you gonna do with this table to understand it and to convince us that it's safe to, to do analysis with? Great, so there's a few related questions um, that are all kind of about how do you think um, DCIC and Pirate slash your whole pedagogy should connect to external things? So people have questions like, do you think that Pirate should script Python? Do you think that um, Pirate slash Python should be used to interact with like, you know, hardcore numerical kernels? Do, when you talk about tables, does that introduce things to relational algebra? So uh, I, um, I wanted to sort of tell you all of those questions and have you kind of react to how does DCIS fit into that larger picture that you showed at the very beginning about the uh, advanced CS things? Okay, so to be clear, we're not after the one language to rule them all strategy, right? Um, we're trying to come up with the right solutions for students at appropriate pedagogic points in a curriculum. And Pirate has been designed for a, um, a spread of courses, intro up through say programming language style courses uh, based on research we've done in education. The goal is not to build that out to encompass everything that someone might do in any other language. In the context of DCIC, I'm using Pirate to build up your foundations about computing in a environment that was designed for pedagogy and then help you transition into Python where a lot of the professional practice goes on. I just don't wanna throw you into all the corner cases of Python right from the start. So are we looking to necessarily cover all of the advanced topics? No, what I'm trying to do is leave you in a spate where you have learned how to think about data when you've been given a, set, a piece of data. When you know the fundamentals of working with functions and data types and data structures and how do you piece these together, you're going to go off and use whatever languages are normative for those areas as you prepare to be a, a computing professional. And that's the way it should be. Um, so maybe I'm missing a, a subtext of what somebody's asking about there, but I don't think the goal is to build one comprehensive solution to all this. I think the goal is to build a solid educational solution that students can then build out from to go join professional communities of practice that they're gonna work in eventually. Great, I think that's uh, great now for the, for the combined live stream questions. So we're gonna switch now back to the gather um, and in one hour will be our next uh, speaker. Um, and so I will interrupt the gather again um, when it's time to move back over to the live stream. So thank you again, Kathy. Thank and, you, everybody. Um, I'll see you all in the in the hallway. Okay, so.